A lot of people talk about it, but very few actually follow through. We sold everything, the car, the house. We sunk it all into a boat, a sailboat, and then set off on a mission to sail around the world. We've lost all of our power. Oh That's a marlin. The marlin. Ditching the career, selling everything, and taking off. How do we make enough money at age 35 to quit our jobs, buy the boat, and go sailing around the world? What did it take to get there, and how are they doing? So we're at the Yacht Club. This is where we grew up. This is where we taught sailing in the summer, made a little bit of money for university. This is the actual lawn where we got married. We didn't actually meet up there. We actually met here. This is the dinghy dock. This was summer camp back in the day. This brings back so many memories. This is where we used to teach most of our lessons when we were teaching sailing. Split tack, speed tests, transit, roll tacking, and all this wonderful stuff that we used to teach the kids. We never raced to get it, but we were really good competitors. Mine was like the oldest laser in the whole entire world. This is like the vintage of the one I sailed, faded red. It literally was called faded red. And Ben had old faded, faded blue. blue. <laughs> faded blue. <laughs> it was a lifelong dream of theirs, but it took family tragedy to really get it off the ground. Ten years ago, my dad passed away pretty young, and it was the catalyst, the kind of kick in the butt we needed to get our axe in gear and start actually properly saving for this trip. He got sick suddenly, very suddenly. Skin cancer had spread all through his body. He was diagnosed at 51 and died at 52. Within about eight months, he was gone. And what we realized was that we might not get the chance to grow old. We may not be around for retirement. It took us just that realization to kind of really kick our asses in gear because we were being a bit a bit slow, a bit lazy. I oh, will get to our dream. It's a great dream. We'll do it later. And all of a sudden we're like, no, no, I think, I think we'll do it now. After graduation, we started the grind. And funnily enough, we worked in the same building. I was on I was on five and you were on four? We meet up for lunch. <laughs> it was awesome. Kind of convenient actually. We loved our jobs back then, but we worked our butts off. Let's actually cut to the chase and talk about money. We were really actually shitty at saving. We actually took vacations. Every year we would go on vacations. Right after my dad died, we took a vacation to the BVI's and that totally cemented our sailing dream. It was, yeah. we, we bare boat chartered a boat. I have no idea how they let us. We were like 28 years old and stupid and had no idea how to like deal with a, a monohull sailboat around the BVI's, but we took it out. We didn't hit anything. We had a, a blast and we were like, all right, that's it, we're doing this. So it took us another six years after that moment, after that vacation, to get our shit, kaka, together to get out here. It was crazy, that's a huge growth period from when you're 28 to when you're 34. This is where we grew up. This is the inner harbor of Victoria. It's pretty cool here. We got seaplanes, we got boats. Oh, look at the plane's about to take off. I sometimes had to go to work on one of these. I used to work right over there. I was a, I was a manager at a software company, um, but I did everything there. I was with them for a long time. I loved my company. They were fantastic. I had a computer science degree, and I started a, a company in Victoria. I did tugboat software. Isn't that weird? I love boats. Can you get that? You get that, right? I was with them till the very end when we left on this vacation. This vacation. It's not a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> What did Ben do? I worked from home. I worked from a home office. I had my. I actually did the exact opposite. So I think I actually changed jobs twice, three times. Each time I changed a job, I went up in pay scale. It's funny how that works. I would be at a job. I'd find I wasn't super passionate about it. So then I'd find a new job, quit the first job, go to the second job, find this wasn't really my passion. So I'd find a new job. I finally decided I actually want to own my own business. So I started a consulting company, consulting in open source GIS, so software mapping. It took us seven years to get this dream going. And I didn't always make this much money, but at the end of my career, I was making about $100,000 a year, Canadian. At the end of my consulting career, I was making about 120,000 US dollars per year. And we kept all of that in the company. Let's take a, a tiny step away from finance for two seconds and talk about well-being while you're at home. You're going to be saving for the trip of your lifetime. It could take you 10 years, it could take you 20 years, it could take you five years, it could take you two years. Okay, two years, maybe suck it up and like give everything up. But if it's gonna take you five to 10 years to save, 
don't give up on living because you're gonna be miserable and you might fail then because it's it's really freaking hard to live every day, never take a day off, never go on a vacation, never do anything for yourself, give up your gym membership, don't do that. I went to yoga, I loved yoga. I, I, I went to yoga every day. I never gave up my membership to the yoga studio. We went skiing, we love, we love snowboarding. We still kept passes, our mountain was pretty pretty inexpensive. This isn't Whistler Black Home we're talking about here, but it's a nice mountain because we always bought them on the early bird sale and you know, whatever. We did got it, we did everything the cheapest we could. So we still had two motorbikes actually, as a matter of fact, while we we're still saving. And what we did is we took those motorbikes to say a family cabin or on a camping trip. It was a lot cheaper doing that, staying local and taking local vacations than going on say halfway around the world on some big extravagant vacation. Well-being is number one, and then all the savings come follow that. We always wanted to set sail around the world. It was something we always wanted to do. And it took us, it took us a heck of a long time to finally get the cash we needed to get a boat, a, a boat that we wanted to sail around the world. We lived entirely off my salary, and everything Ben made, we kept in the company, in US dollars. Being in Canada, that really helped because the US mm -hmm dollar was much higher than the Canadian. One of the things that we found really valuable is we had a really good accountant that was really knowledgeable in the tax law. There's a difference between tax evasion and tax efficiency. W what we found really advantageous is that if you leave money in a company, you can pull that out of the company after you quit your jobs, which means your income tax bracket is much lower mm -hmm. than when you're actually working and you're a high earner. We sort of did this trickery thing where it wasn't actually a trick, it was allowed, where we took a loan from the company and then paid it back to ourselves through the company over two years. And that allowed us to really keep the personal tax really low on the funds that we used to pay for the boat. Then we sold up, we sold the house, sold the car, and most of our winter clothes really <laughs> most of our possessions went out the window um, and we sunk our winnings into a boat whose idea was it to sail around the world anyways it was my idea oh, i loved sailing i always wanted to do it i really wanted to go sail around the world i love travel i love travel so i'm just i'm just rigging up a fishing rod so how do we find our boat and how do you know it was our boat then what actually happened is we put in an offer on a lagoon 380 a 38 foot catamaran and we'd never actually step foot on a catamaran. I wouldn't recommend that actually. We lived on the west coast of Canada, so we flew down to Florida, had a look at this boat, had it surveyed. It turns out it was way overpriced for its condition, and uh, that deal fell through. Okay, so we're gonna just briefly touch on one more thing, which is... How we kind of got lucky, actually, when we bought the boat. Things that are sort of outside of your control, but can influence how much a boat costs are things that you might want to start paying attention to when you're getting really close to buying. Things like that are recessions, currencies. Currency exchange is huge. If your money's in US dollars and you're buying a boat, say, in euros, like we did, then maybe if Greece threatens to exit the EU and the euro tanks, you know, maybe that's a good time to buy. Turns out it really was. We'd found the boat, we had agreed to a price, and then what happened is Greece threatened to exit the European Union. The euro tanked and we hadn't exchanged our money into the euro yet because we were still under contract waiting for the previous people to finish their sabbatical. Over the next two, three months, we gained, I don't know how much, but a fair amount, probably 10%. Uh, yeah, probably. Probably about 10% of the boat value in just currency currency exchanges. So it's something to consider. If you're looking to buy a boat and you have a tight budget, you could look at other countries and see what those currencies are like. Totally. And maybe buy your boat in a recession. No one else is buying boats. If you have the money, I mean, are you retiring? Maybe it's the perfect time for you and not everyone else. We thought like a 38 foot catamaran was huge when we looked at them on Yacht World. Turns out they're actually not that big. For sailing around the world, the most boats we've seen out here are actually 46 foot and up monohulls at a minimum and probably 41 foot plus catamarans. 38, you hardly ever see a 38 foot catamaran out here. Fish. Oh, there's tons of fish, fish here. Cast the rod, man. I gotta get it up first. Cast the rod, dude. No, I can't, I can't, I suck at this. Dude, give it to me. Here, but don't hit me in the head with it. This is dinner in the making right here. Watch this.
Okay, what happened next? Actually, the day after that Lagoon 380, the 38 foot catamaran fell through, we I saw Nahoa online and I called Germany right away. I've lived in Germany a long time, but my I moved away when I was like eight years old, so my German's quite broken. Anyways, I stuttered through a sentence to the boat broker, all nervous, and uh, she's like, yeah, well, let me put you in touch with the owner. And so I got in touch with the owner right away and it was the most beautiful, purchase in the sense of the buyer wanting to buy and the seller wanting to sell and both parties being reasonable. It was a private deal but in the end we uh, officially officially bought uh, the boat in the Bahamas. We moved on board in Florida. It was it was a hilarious time in our lives like we we're like oh yeah we've got all this shit we want to take down to the boat and no problem we'll just like yeah, hop on a plane and go down to Florida and pick up our boat and move on. And then we started to put pack and it was like no way we were never gonna make it to the boat on a plane with the amount of stuff we had so we looked at shipping we looked at all the options for getting to florida and finally finally we were we decided that you know we'll just buy a little tiny trailer and do a road trip down there and you know knock off a few things along the way we had some time to kill we weren't taking ownership of the boat until like march or something we bought a bowler, like a bowler is a hilarious little egg trailer. They're like fiberglass little tiny trailers. Ben is six foot four. The trailer was, I think six feet wide, like, and it was 13 feet long and it was just hilarious. We had so much fun. Oh, I got a nibble, I think. We, we took it to the Grand Canyon. He set my shirt on fire as we used the stove for heating. Frick man, we drove all the way across the country with this hilarious tra trailer in tow and it was a lot of fun. Then we got to Florida and we camped. We were doing a survey in Florida before we you know, moved aboard and then officially bought the boat in the Bahamas. We lived in a trailer park in like basically downtown Florida for like a month and a half, like it was ridiculous. We had to keep extending our permits in the park and like it was, it was hilarious. It, oh! Where'd it go? We're over there, I let go too soon. This little lure's kinda good. And then we set off, set off to sail around the world. Our first cruising was the easy cruising of the Bahamas and we had just a fantastic first couple months. We weren't vlogging yet though, so you guys didn't get to see any of that. Maybe Ben can find some pictures from that time. It was, a, it was an amazing time. And then we set back to the United States to go do some, to do a little boat rehab. And we did a huge refit on Nahoa. So when we left, when we were ready to leave, when we quit our jobs, we had enough money to buy the boat outright and- What we thought, two to five years of living expenses. So between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars is kind of what we thought we might need to live off of. But whoa! Didn't actually work out that way, let me tell you. How long did we make it last in the end? I think we lived off that for three years. Yeah, just about three years. What we thought we had budgeted for the refit got blown out of the water by, I don't know, three, five, six times. We wanted a hard top and we wanted to redo the bottom. We had to redo the sail bag, rudder bearings, some through holes that were stuck, just basic boat maintenance. We didn't end up pulling out of Virginia until, I don't know what it was, December. It had gotten really cold at that point, really cold. This hey, is, get this. This get is this. trick. You gotta do this. So, so there's a couple things that we found really valuable. First was our accountant. He was really knowledgeable in tax laws. And the second thing was our mortgage broker. He was a cool dude and he gave us some amazing advice. And that was to, while you still are, you know, relatively high earning jobs, go get yourselves a couple un unsecured. unsecured line of credits, yeah. interest only payments. You know, you have a good job right now, go get yourself a contingency fund. Within one week, we went around to, I think three banks. Mileage may vary in your country. We're in Canada. This was uh, yeah. five years ago, four years ago. Go get yourself an unsecured line of credit for as much as they'll give you. While you're still working. And make sure that the payments are interest only. We do not have a mortgage on this boat, but we do have some line of credits now that basically the boat covers the line of credits. And then really that's where the sail around the world started. And then from there, we sailed back down through the Caribbean. We did the USVIs, the BVIs, Puerto Rico. We went across to uh, 
St. Martin down through the Eastern Caribbean Islands all the way down to Grenada where, where we pulled the boat out for hurricane season. And uh, that's where that's where the vlog started. That's where we got we got this dream to start making videos. They're pretty funny at the beginning. You guys should check them out. They're a lot better now. And now four years at sea, they're halfway on their journey. Sailed across the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, and last year crossed the Pacific Ocean, went down to New Zealand, and are in Palau. They've sailed over 20,000 nautical miles, hit 27 countries. Come the new year, they'll continue their expedition into Southeast Asia, then hit South Africa, go around the Cape, and back to the Caribbean. It's, it's hard as heck to take those first steps. So we've been out here four years and we wouldn't change a thing. It's scary as all hell really to sell up and, and leave and like sell your house and- Quit your job. Quit your job and, and, and buy a boat and set sail and then spend all this money fixing the boat. The good out, outweighs the bad by a lot. I think if you were to take anything away from this is that we're not special. We worked hard, we saved, we made some strategic decisions, and we made it work. Yeah, and I mean, we're not rich, and we can't imagine, I can't imagine a lifestyle other than this now, and we're going, we're going hard, man. We have to continue working, obviously, and uh, you know, now the videos are work, and this is part of our lifestyle, and so we work out here, we work for our living, and you, without you guys, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do that. If you believe that everything will work out, opportunities will open up and you will have the time of your life. No, we don't have retirement savings. No, we don't have RSPs or whatever, 401k or whatever it is that everyone has. We don't have that. But we do have this life experience and we're so grateful for that. And we'll do whatever we need to do to continue on as long as we can. It's, it's a lifestyle choice. Thought we'd share this with you and uh, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with another upload. Perfect. See you then.